Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Alex Zergachev, and this is my colleague Dave Vasilovsky. We work at Evolving Web. Uh, thanks very much for coming to this unreasonably early talk. Um, I guess if you're here, that means you're extra motivated, so no, no snoozing. No snoozing. Um, today, we're going to talk about test-driven Drupal upgrades, whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so first, a little bit about us. Uh, so Evolving Web is uh, a Drupal development company here in Montreal. We've been doing Drupal since Drupal 6 just came out. And uh, you know, we naively dived in, dove into Drupal 6 instead of 5, which is every, what everybody else was using for the next year and a half. So we learned Drupal the hard way uh, with having to fix every contrib module. Um, we, we've been quite involved over the years in the Drupal community with sponsoring these camps and presentations and, and uh, you know, contributions in code and, and all kinds of stuff like that. Once in a while, we still even host the Drupal meetups, which we used to do quite a bit at our office. Um, and uh, in terms of what we what we like to work on, well, we like we're a pretty small team, but we like to work on uh, bigger projects. So some of the stuff that we're describing here is, a, you know, uh, will hopefully uh, re relate to that. Um, we we really don't shy away from deployment and and sysadmin stuff. We uh, we like we like that. Uh, of course, it's Montreal, so multilingual uh, search. And basically, if you have like a huge import job you need to do or integrate with some sort of a system, move data back and forth, uh, we've done plenty of that. Uh, and uh, yeah, and we, we do lots of business here in Quebec, in, in Canada, in Ottawa, and uh, as well in the States. And uh, some of the clients we've had over the years, or some, re some ones worth highlighting, some government stuff, as you see, some even McGill, and a few things for the Linux Foundation. Uh, and uh, the talk. So we're going to discuss what exactly is uh, an upgrade versus an update. Uh, for most of you seasoned Drupal developers, it's going to be pretty basic, but it's still nice to cover the terminology. And then we'll talk about like the basics of testing, which how many here have done lots of unit testing or some unit testing already? We've written, OK, so half the room. Cool, cool. So we'll cover some of that, some of the tools. Uh, and, uh, and we'll do a case study of a project for, for a major upgrade from Drupal 6 to 7 that we worked on for McGill, that with, with Mark actually uh, here to fact check us. Mark, you're, a lot, you're, you're the only guy who's allowed to heckle us and say, no, that's not how it was. Um, and then we'll, uh, yeah, and we'll do some demos as time allows. Um, great. And uh, yeah, one, one, two things I'm, I'm supposed to tell you by my corporate masters, uh, which, which is to say my wife over here. Um, so we have a training program as well. Um, so if you, if you work for an organization that needs Drupal training, anything from, from just intro site building to module development and theme development, uh, we do lots of public and private training, so please reach out to us. And uh, the second thing is we're, we're hiring uh, devs and PMs and designers too. Um, so there's, if it's the right fit, we'll, we've got a position for you. So reach out to us. All right. Um, so this is, this is the only job I ever had. And uh, Dave, uh, you have to say something about yourself. I've been involved in a long time, and I do a lot of uh, random open source work, contributing to projects like... Uh, KDE and Fink and Firefox and lots of things, and so I'm always looking for random development projects. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, just uh, yeah, like I said, let's let's get some terminology out of the way. So, upgrades. Oh, sorry, actually, and some motivation too. So, so upgrades are super important for security, keeping your site up to date. Everyone knows about Drupal Geddon here, right? Like, anyone actually got like hacked as a result of it? Hopefully not. But it was, a, it was a, just a security vulnerability that would allow an arbitrary person to, to make the right post request to your Apache web server and take full control over the server. And, uh, and basically, they released the patch. And they said, you have a few hours to apply this patch. Because in a few hours from this patch going live, your site's going to get hacked. So everyone scrambled to do it. So uh, this requires upgrading Drupal core or updating Drupal core, uh, which in theory is really simple. But in practice, there's nuances to it, right? Um, so, so that's what this talk is going to be about, is how to do it safely and well. Um, and then the other reason you might want to upgrade is you get new features. Everyone knows from 6 to 7 to 8, you get lots of amazing new features. Uh, but uh, when you do a real upgrade, like from 6 to 7 or 7 to 8, uh, it's almost like a rebuild. So you have to, you have to weigh that. Um, and of course, uh, in case you think, oh, it's not worth it, uh, just a friendly reminder that in, in a few months or even sooner, when Drupal 8 is released, three months after that, I think, is the window when Drupal 6 will officially be no longer supported. And so everyone's waiting to see what, what the heck's going to happen. Um, yeah. So, 
So okay, so that's why you want to upgrade. Now, now like let's let's think why you don't want to upgrade. You know, like everyone everyone agrees how important it is. But uh, who here is maintaining a Drupal site and maybe has some either core or contrib out of date for for a month or five? Anyone? Be honest. I should ask who here is is like honest. <laughs> uh, yeah. So so no one no one is consistent about upgrading all their core and contrib modules, and uh, sometimes it's not even practical. Um, so what are the reasons why? Uh, well, some, sometimes you don't know exactly the steps you're supposed to follow. I mean, obviously, you might know about, like, download the, the, the tar file, untar it, and you're good to go. But there's more than that. Uh, it takes time, um, especially if you don't have a good documented process that you could just, like, sort of follow step by step. It, uh, and, and then sometimes it breaks, breaks things. And, and if you have a website, you know, you, you know about this Drupal Geddon, but you have a website and it works right now, and, and like, somebody just tells you, you have to upgrade right now, for all you know, it might take 30 minutes or 10 minutes, or it might take all day because you broke something and you'll, figure out, you'll be struggling to figure out what. Um, and of course, going hand in hand with breaking things, you have to test what you just did. So you have to pretty much retest your whole site because any arbitrary piece of it might break. And hopefully you have an automated procedure for doing that, right? Right? Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the pain points that we identified around that. So it can change by by learning how to do it, so we'll discuss the basic steps, and you guys can think through and fill in the blanks, of course, for your, for your own use case. Uh, and we'll discuss the, the kind of tools that, uh, and process that we've, we've set up for ourselves to try to uh, simplify it. It's a work in progress. We, we're, we're not gods at this by any means. Um, but hopefully, it's useful for you. And of course, automated testing. Uh, so point on terminology, uh, minor versus minor, minor updates versus major upgrades. Uh, so minor is like Drupal 7.35 to Drupal 7.36. Um, and the sa same thing not just for core, but for contrib modules. And, and these basically are not supposed to ever break anything. They sometimes do, but they're not supposed to. So you're supposed to be safe to just run Drush DL uh, web form and, and get the latest version of web form. Um, and for major upgrades, that's going from Drupal 6, some version, the latest, to Drupal 7. And that one's a lot more exciting, and that's pretty much guaranteed to break everything, or most things. Um, so, so this is really, really nice because at the end you almost as if you have a new site, but it's really, you know, challenging because it's almost like making a new site sometimes. Um, so, how to do or what is a minor update? Uh, well, first of all, if you if you follow the mailing list on Drupal.org/security, you're going to get emails about security releases. So, if anyone's not aware of this, please check that out. Uh, and uh, and also, there's a there's a little module in Core uh, that uh, gives you status for every contrib module: is it up to date or not? Um, and uh, you got to do it in in staging. So, it's, maybe it's very tempting to just run a single command on prod and just move on with your day. But remember, you have, a, you have a deployment process, right? You have a dev, maybe a staging, maybe, and certainly a prod environment. And, uh, and you have to push code from dev to prod. So stick with it. Like, so, so fix it on dev, push it to staging, test it there, and then move it to prod. Um, because 5% of the time, there might be something that you don't like. It might not be a catastrophic break of things, but it, you know, there might be uh, some conflict when you, when you do it. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is from time to time, uh, you might not have committed something to Git properly on your, on your environment in prod, so you have to be watch out for that. And of course, you, you may be maintaining patches against your contrib modules, even with Git, but even if you do this, I mean, when you download the new version of a contrib module, any patches you may have had against it just got blown away. So you have to have a process in place. We're not gonna go into how you do it, but you have to have a process in place to track all the patches you have and then reapply them every time which again complicates what should be a trivial, seamless operation. And, and very often, if you do have patched modules, chances are you have some custom code that relies on the patch, and that custom code might, might break, like actually. Uh, and you should be, if you ever inherit a website from somebody else and you don't know what's, what contrib or core modules have been patched or hacked, there's, a, I believe, a module called Hacked that uh, gives you a nice little report on this. It downloads everything from Drupal.org and new and compares, uh, is this the same code base as I'm looking at? Um, to do the update in place, well, first you do drush pm update status. That's the drush command of that screenshot you just saw, and it tells you everything that needs to go. And then you run drush pm update, and I think you can 
I don't remember. Can you give it just the name of a specific module or? Can you give the name of the module? Yeah. Like the so you can give it a name and a version to update too. Uh, so, so that's drush ups and drush up, I believe. Um, so then if this is a real site, you still want to do it in dev and then staging, test it in staging, then commit, and then deploy to staging, test again on staging, and then deploy on prod, and then test again on prod. Sorry, that is actually what you should be doing. Um, if obviously you have a, a low traffic site and you don't mind it being down for an hour and a half, like, like it's a pet project for your, for your community choir, maybe you can, you can be a little cowboy about it. Uh, keep in mind that what this does is it updates the Drupal code base and it, uh, very often uh, when the code changes, the underlying database structure changes. For example, if the new version of a module has a brand new table that it expects to be there and it installs it when you newly install or enable the module, when you do the update, you won't have the table unless you tell Drupal, hey, can you check if this module declares any database migrations, any, any update hooks in Drupal terms uh, that need to be run to bring my existing Drupal database up to date and then run that. This, this part is actually the reason updates are dangerous because if the mi migrations have a bug in it, they're not really, they're often not rollbackable, rollbackable. And, uh, and so uh, if you do it straight on prod, you may very well corrupt your production database and then you won't know how to fix it. Um, so you'll have to restore it from a backup. Um, but usually it works fine and uh, you just want to update that PHP or there's a Drush version of that called Drush updb and that'll look for all the migrations that need to be run. It, 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 Drupal actually internally tracks what version of the module you have installed and for each module, what, what, like, what is the latest migration that uh, has been run versus what is the latest migration that exists and it'll say, aha, you're missing these three. Okay, so next section is major upgrade basics. Uh, for dramatic effect, I have an empty slide because uh, there's no such thing as a basic uh, major upgrade. It's, it's, uh, you gotta be ready for a huge pain in the butt, like at best for Drupal sites of any complexity, a matter of weeks or maybe more. Um, yeah, so that's, that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, very often, depending on the exact situations, it's actually harder so this is from six to seven, right? Or seven to eight, or six to eight, as many of you may be facing. Um, it may actually be harder to, to do a in-place upgrade than to do a whole rebuild of the site and then write migrations to pull the data in. In fact, uh, it's, it's so notoriously difficult that people are still figuring out what is the recommended path for Drupal 8. I mean, I don't think, I haven't been following that closely, but uh, this, this has not been clear to anyone. And, uh, and so you should almost assume that you'll be building a brand new Drupal 8 website and you'll be writing a lot of migration code to pull in all the data. Um, the reason that things are particularly difficult is that Drupal from in major versions is not afraid to introduce API changes that are not backwards compatible for your theme code, for your, for your module code, for your custom modules, and of course for any contrib modules that have not been updated yet. Um, so, and when Drupal 8 changes, every contrib module has to go with it and if you have some of them are never updated. Some of them yeah. just never get around to it. So yeah, that's right. And uh, so depending on how many contrib modules you guys are using, maybe half of them have an update in the works. Half of them have no update yet. A third of them might never have an update, and you're just going to have to scramble to find another module to replace it, or write custom code, or get rid of that feature because you never really needed it in the first place. Um, great. <clears throat> so the steps to perform a major upgrade are a little bit more involved than a minor update, as, as the terminology suggests. So first, you have to do minor updates to core and all the contrib modules. So the, the slides we'll talk about from going from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, because we haven't done a 7 to 8 upgrade yet, so I can't comment. Um, yeah, so, up, so if you're at an old version of Drupal 6, get the newest one. Um, same thing for every contrib module, which is a feat if you have 100. Um, Defeaturize, so features are great because they put con configuration into code, right? Um, but keep in mind that there is no magic upgrade path of your custom features. There is no feature upgrade module that, that takes your custom exported PHP features and rewrites them to be compatible with Drupal 7 or Drupal 8. Uh, so you have to figure out what feature does behind the scenes to get the stuff into code, reverse the process one way or another for each kind of thing. So for each content type, for each field, for each view, you have to, or for each type of those things, you have to figure out what to do. And uh, 
and it, so that's what we call defeaturize. It's it took a day and a half in, in the in the time that, in the project we will talk about later, uh, but it's it's actually not much to it. Um, yeah. So then you have to clean up and fix bugs because it, doing the upgrade itself will introduce lots of bugs. So you may as well uh, get them while they're small, if you will. Um, and uh, you should, you should try to keep your life simple by disabling all contrib and op optional modules because many things will, so many things will break when you go to Drupal 7 that uh, you want to minimize the amount of like error messages you have to deal with at once. And then you have some control over the process. You're going to enable them one at a time, two at a time, and seeing if they work and, and upgrading them. Um, and uh, you should be aware that some modules have broken migrations. That's just a fact of life. If you have enough modules, not all of them will have a migration path. So that means in the middle of your may maybe long migration, you're just going to get a critical fatal error message. So be ready to uninstall them because that's what you have to do to work around that. And then, and then yeah. And another thing is your custom theme will probably not work in Drupal, in the new version of Drupal. So uh, switch to something like Garland in Drupal 6, and then it'll become Bartik in Drupal 7. Then you're going to perform the actual update, upgrade. Um, so you're going to download, so you've already got the latest version of Drupal 6, but now you're going to Drush DL Drupal 7 and Drush DL every module that you have enabled, or maybe all of them, I don't remember, uh, to Drupal 7. Yeah, I think all of them. Um, so once the code is updated, which is easy, right? It's just like a couple of Drush commands. Uh, you run Drush updb to run those migrations that we talked about. And then if it's a small site, it'll take a short amount of time. If it's a large site, it'll take an indefinitely long amount of site, um, and lots of things will break. And so this Drush DB step is going to be one where you're iterating on a lot of times. And so you're going to have a Drupal 6 database dump that you keep resetting to. Um, you should be aware that in Drupal 6, uh, thanks, Dave. you should be aware that in Drupal 6 we have uh, CCK that became fields, and migrating CCK data to fields data structure is not done by Drush up DB. I'm not sure why uh, Core decided to do it that way, but there's a contrib module called Content Migrate that handles this task. And it works reasonably well, although it's, I would say, under-optimized because in, in the case that I'll talk about later, it was quite slow, but it works fine. Um, so then you're going to re-enable all the, so after your migrations have run, it doesn't mean you have your site's done because um, all your custom modules are still disabled, you still have no theme, and all the contrib modules that you couldn't find in a, an upgraded version are gone. So you're going to re-enable and test all these contrib modules they will probably have lots of errors in it, and you'll submit patches to Drupal.org. That's OK, um, especially if you're talking about Drupal 8 now. Um, so you'll just iterate a lot on, <clears throat> on testing it, fixing the code, fixing the migrations, and then run, run, running Drush DB again. Um, and as, as, I, as we mentioned, sometimes things like the pop-ups module in Drupal 6 doesn't exist in Drupal 7, but it has a perfectly good replacement of references dialog, which is very similar. So uh, that's, that's what you have to sort of figure out. And then the same thing for custom modules. So you can do, there's a, there's a module called Coder and a sub-module called Coder, Coder Upgrade that does a static analysis of your custom PHP code. And it'll go and annotate every function saying, this is your hook form alter, looks like that, now it should look like this. So it's, it's, it doesn't upgrade it for you, but it actually runs through your custom code base and, and simplifies your job. Um, then you, so once you iterate on those, you, you can restore the theme. And then adjust the site as necessary, you're going to rebuild the site basically piece by piece. Uh, oh, yeah, and the last thing here is who's highly, highly familiar, familiar with Drupal's database structure? Like you could name most of the tables and most of the columns within those tables, all the, all the field tables and the like. Well, you're going to be at the end of a major upgrade, so just so you know. Um, all right, um, so that was the, the, the upgrade basics, and, and my colleague Dave will, will talk about uh, the testing basics. Hi. So we're going to talk about several kinds of testing here because there's several different ways of doing it. Um, some of the kinds you might have heard of are unit testing, integration testing, and UI testing. And those are going to be the, the core of this part of the talk. So let's talk about unit testing first. Unit testing is really useful. It, you basically say, I'm going to take an individual tiny part of my site and test it in isolation. I'm not going to rely on my site having a database, on my site having a real like, web server running. I'm just going to test a little bit of code. And it isolates it, and it's really, really good in some ways. It's super fast, because you don't have to provision a site just to get your tests running. And it's, it makes sure you're testing just your function, not how it interrelates to other things. So it's really good for some use cases. But it really sucks for upgrades. It doesn't help you in that case, because 
in upgrades, it's not the individual piece of code that you're worried about breaking. It's how it interrelates to other parts of your site. So it's useful, but we're not going to consider it much more in this talk. And another kind of upgrade that's much, another kind of test that's much more useful for upgrades is integration testing. So integration testing basically says I'm going to test my site as it fits in all together. And in Drupal, you do this with something called simple test, uh, which has a, a class that you would inherit from if you're writing an integration test called the Drupal web test case. And so integration testing in Drupal is really powerful. It lets you, yeah, you have to um, enable the modules you want and create the content you want and basically set up almost a mini site to do your tests on. But again, in Drupal, the way it does integration tests is it tests your module in like pseudo isolation. Your module plus the other modules that it needs, it will test. But it won't test other things that depend on the module in question. So if you're updating some module, let's say you're updating web form, and web form has some integration tests written, web form's integration tests, they already like ran all these tests on the people who wrote web form, already ran all these tests when they were preparing the update. Uh, of web form, and they already checked that web form and all its dependencies work fine. But then the problem that you have is on your site, there are other things that depend on web form. Maybe those are contrib modules, maybe they're custom modules that you wrote, and the integration tests don't touch those at all. So they don't really help you that much. Also, one of the problems with integration tests is every time you run one, it has to basically reprovision a site. It's really slow, it needs to run essentially a site install, and it makes them really inconvenient to use, and a lot of people just don't like them. And then finally, the integration tests, at least the way Drupal does them, they can't test a lot of things. They can test basically HTTP requests, but they can't test things like JavaScript or CSS. If your site displays poorly, it might, look, it might run fine in terms of what HTML is coming out of the site and what post requests are going in, but it might look terrible, and the integration test won't help you find that out. So the kind of testing that we're more, interesting, more interested in is UI testing. And what this does is it basically has a real browser, a real instance of Chrome or Firefox that goes and navigates your site. And it can click on things, and it can execute JavaScript, and it can do all the things that a browser can do, all the things that a user does when they visit your site. And so there's various tools, like Selenium or Casper.js, that will control these browsers and tell them what to do and follow a whole bunch of steps and make sure that the right thing is happening at each step. And it basically replaces the manual testing that you would do otherwise. Instead of, you know, when you do an upgrade, you have to click around and make sure that things are working. This thing just does the clicking around for you. And it tries every feature of your site that you set it up with. So we use a tool called Behat to do UI testing. Behat is a, a tool that, uh, that uses what we call BDD or behavior driven upgrades which is kind of the idea that you should come up with the behavior of your site first and start writing tests for it and specifying how should my site behave and then build the site itself and see if it matches these tests. And you don't have to use it that way. In many cases, we don't. But it means that it's, well, it, it's designed in a way so that normal people can understand it, that it specifies the behavior of your site in a way that you don't have to be a dev to really understand what Behat is doing. And so reasons we like Behat are, first of all, it does UI testing, like we said. Um, is really well integrated with Drupal because it has this Drupal extension, which works really well to let you do things like create content types if you need them, create users if you need them, and yeah, regular people can understand them. So in Behat, you write a bunch of scenarios, and each scenario is one, it's basically a test that you're saying, please do some things and see if it works right. So let's say you have a site where there's a bunch of articles, and each article has a little area where it shows the author. And when you hover over the author, the, that section, maybe it's an email address, and then it'll show the name of the author. And so this is a test that would test that. And it's, it's almost plain English. It says, here's this my scenario with the name of my scenario, show author on hover. If I'm viewing an article with the following content, with a title, with an author, and with a body, and there's some region of this, this page, some CSS region, essentially, that has, um, that that's, I've called author, then I should see the text blob when I do that hover. And so these rules, these, these different phrases in the scenario are of three types. There's given types, which are basically set up. There's when, which is an action. And there's then, which is the, uh, hmm? an assertion. Yeah, it's basically saying I should see this result. And so in this case, the given rule is something that's part of the Drupal extension, which knows about Drupal content types and knows how to create an article. And then the when step, when I hover over the region, is something, 
that we implemented custom. And it's really easy to implement custom behat steps. So there's an example right below of how we implemented when I hover over the region, uh, over the author region. That region is a wildcard there. It has a colon in front of it, which specifies that this, is, this can be replaced by some text the user gives. And we have this, this um, we, ha we have this basically comment that says, here is the pattern that when you match this pattern, you should run this rule. And it just runs some, some PHP code that says, get the region of the page and mouse over it. And that does the hover. So it's really easy to extend bhat with the steps you need. So I'm going to skip that. Um, one of the things that we like, that we find is really tough with tests, especially integration tests and UI tests, is they take a really long time. On the project we're on now, I think our UI tests take about 10 or 15 minutes to run. And you don't want to sit there every time you make a two-line change of code and run all your UI tests and make sure everything's working OK. And because you don't want that, you end up not running the tests, and that's terrible. So what we use is continuous integration. It's basically a server that sits there. And every time we make a commit and we push our commit, it runs all of our tests. It, com it builds our site, runs all the tests, and reports to us on the results. If there's a, an error, it will tell us, hey, somebody broke the build. And we use a system called Circle CI for this, which it, I believe it has a free tier now. Um, but you can also get paid tiers if you like. And it's really useful. It integrates with GitHub, which is what we use for most of our development. So every time we do a push to GitHub, it automatically knows that something happened. It sends us email notifications every time something breaks. Um, it catches things that we really don't expect. So sometimes we'll have a build which, even though we didn't realize it, it depends on a server somewhere existing. So oh, it, dep yeah, it depends on the existence of a server somewhere in the universe. And sometimes that server goes down because for reasons you don't expect. And you wouldn't figure this out until you know, months or even a year later when somebody says, hey, my site is broken. Can you, you know, fix it? And you try to do a rebuild, and it just fails, and you have no idea what's going on. And with our integration server, that just catches that, and we find out about it in advance. And finally, a reason like we really like Circle CI in preference to other CI systems is that it lets us use Docker, uh, which is a tool that lets us build consistent environments. So we make sure that when we're running our tests in CI, they're exactly the same as um, the tests that we're running in prod, that we don't have any, any uh, different versions of PHP or different versions of MySQL. We don't have any like different file system layouts. Nothing's different. They're exactly the same. And so if, something, if, if there's something that's going to break in, in uh, prod, it'll also be broken in CI. Uh, it's terrible when you have something where you, you run all your tests and it works perfectly well, and your client calls you up and is like, well, I don't care that you say it works perfectly well. It's not working for me. And your tests just don't catch it. But with Circle CI and Docker, it's all caught. Um, so do you want to take the Docker part? Or? No, I should go? OK. So Docker is a tool that basically does, um, it's like a VM, like Vagrant or, or uh, VirtualBox, but it lets you run kind of lightweight containers that are much easier to spin up and down compared to like a virtual machine, which will take a minute to start. And so it also has a really good um, provisioning system, essentially. It lets you run a bunch of steps and to, to set up your Docker container and make sure that it, it basically has the exact same setup on every machine. Um, we really, really like using it, especially for, uh, for testing updates. Because when we test an update somewhere, like the updates are the things that touch your file system all over the place. They really depend on the layout of your site, on the version of everything. And you have to make sure everything's the same. So when we use Docker and we make sure that prod runs in Docker and dev runs in Docker and they're the exact same Docker containers, then you don't have to worry about changes there. So when you use Circle CI with Docker, you just configure it with this one little file, which is a circle.yaml file. YAML is a format. It kind of looks like it's basically like JSON, but it's a little easier to read. And so in this case, we say that one of the things that we need for Circle CI is Docker. We specify it as a service. And then we set up the steps that you're going to run use with the Docker command to set up your site. In this case, we just run Docker build, and it builds our project, and then Docker run, and it set, runs the container. And then you set up uh, a command to say, what, is the, what are the tests we're going to run? In this case, we run a drush test run. This would run integration tests. And, uh, and it just runs that when it does the continuous integration testing on your site. It's really easy to set up. Whoa. And now I'm going to do a little demo of uh, the kind of things that we do with BHAT and CircleCI and Docker.
So here we go. We have a site that we call Drupal Docker Marriage because we used it to, because uh, we used this site to set up um, uh, basically a wedding site for a friend of Alex's. Um, and it is at. I think I took it down. I'm sorry? The public one I took down. Yeah, that's okay. So we're going to go to the site. We already have it running, I think. I should already have it running. Can you pick up your mic? Me, yeah. Yeah, great. It stays okay. there. Yeah. Okay, so here's the site. And it's pretty simple. It just has uh, a little header with a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of anchor links that go to parts of the site and scroll down when you click them. And at the bottom, it has a little form to RSVP. And so you can just put in your name and an email and uh, reply. And you can submit it. And hopefully, it doesn't actually email somebody, because that would get awkward. And it sets this little thank you message. It's a really simple site. And we're going to show uh, how we test it. Can you please bring up the notes? Are you working on it? OK. So we have a behat.yaml for this site which I can show. I'm going to shush into it. So here's our bhat.yaml. And this configures bhat and tells bhat what it to do. It sets, it's mostly boilerplate. Like this whole part where you set up context is totally boilerplate. And we just tell it some pretty simple stuff about the site, like uh, what driver are we going to use to do testing? How do you access the site? Um, where's the Drupal root for the site? And, and in this part specifically, we define a region called menu active. You don't have to understand this whole file, but just this part is useful. It defines a CSS selector and gives it a name, which we call menu active. And that lets us later in our tests uh, define basically like what part of the site is this thing. Alex? Thank you. That's better. OK. And then we have an actual test, which is here, or a few tests. And they're, they're pretty simple. One of them just tests, does the RSVP work? And it's again, it's pretty human re readable. It says, if I'm an anonymous user and I visit the part of the page that has the RSVP form, and I submit a bunch of data in the form, and I hit submit, then I should see a little thank you message. And it talks about the header navigation. It says, when I visit the site, then the active part of the menu should originally be this little home thing, not lodgings. And then when I click lodgings, and then some Ajax happens, and then lodgings should be selected. So we can run these tests by just running the bhat command. And it'll run them. And you can see it's starting a browser here to actually run the tests in that browser. That's all saved. Yeah, I'm not touching anything. It's just <laughs> happening all automatically. <laughs> And so a lot of green stuff is going on. Green is the good color. It means that everything's working. And all our tests have succeeded. We see two scenarios passed. That's great. But unfortunately, the site is a little old, so it needs some upgrades. And we can see that a lot of things are outdated here. Drupal itself, a whole lot of modules, including Bootstrap, which is the theme, and Webform. So we could try doing some upgrades. We can say, like, let's say we're going to upgrade Webform. So We'll run a command. We'll update it. It'll run. You can see there are update hooks running. And great, now Webform's updated. And we can run our tests again and make sure everything's working. And the tests run. And everything's green. We're happy. But now we can see what happens if a test doesn't work. I believe Bootstrap actually has problems here. Whoops, that is not the right version. So we can update Bootstrap to the latest version in the same uh, branch. And hopefully the Wi-Fi is OK. Yes. And now if I run the tests, you can see, oh, something failed. And so that would prompt us to say, wait, something's failing. We should probably look at the site and see what's going on. And when we look at the site, we see that this, the header is kind of not in the right place, and something went wrong. And so in this case, the test told us, hey, you should look at this thing. Something's going wrong. One thing that's nice about Circle CI is um, you can actually, whoops, Drupal Docker Marriage. It'll actually annotate your GitHub pull request with a little check mark or X 
to say for each pull request or each branch to say this branch did or did not succeed. So in this case, if we turned each of these updates into a branch test, we would get a little notice that our test failed. And when they fail, we can go hit on details and it'll bring us to the build like the one we just did where it will show exactly what went wrong, which is really hard to see, but hopefully you can get it. It's in red on black because that's easy to read. Um, and one of the nice things about using Docker for this is that now, like, we just messed up our site, and that's not great, but if I go here and I can just destroy and, whoops, destroy and rebuild the site, and uh, now it's up again. Well, in a second, it's up again. And now it's up again, and the header's all normal again, and everything's before everything's like it was before I started this whole process. So it's really convenient because when something breaks, you can just get rid of it and start it up again. Uh -huh.